Today we're finishing off our series. We've been looking at 15 words in the New Testament, 15 New Testament words of life, uh, seeing uh, what are these words that are used either only in Scripture or predominantly in Scripture or they're used in the Bible, and we also use them today <clears throat> and trying to see how are we using them today. We're using them the same way that the Scriptures are using these words so that when we come to read Scripture, are we actually reading the words as they're meant to be understood or are we kind of importing our own ideas or like a 2023 Australian version of those words into the Scriptures? Like we looked at love last week and if you ask the average person on the street what is love, uh, it's probably going to be different to some of the ways that Scripture uses the word love. So we need to understand what, you know, what are these words? How are we to understand them so that we can actually see uh, how is God wanting to communicate to us about his love, about the love that we are to have for one another, love we are to have for others. Um, today, it's actually a bonus day. So we've, we've had 15 weeks. <clears throat> bonus word, church is our bonus word. One commentator said about the church that the church is, it is a thing, the church does what it is, and the church organizes what it does. So the church is something, the church does what it is, and then organizes to do that thing as well as we can do that thing. That doesn't really help you actually uh, understand what is the church. And so let's have a look. In fact, let me pray first. Then we're going to have a look. We're going to um, camp a little bit in the, in the letter to the Romans today. Uh, but we're also going to be looking at you know, a bit of a survey through the New Testament to see about what is the church. And <clears throat> I'm very confident, just like we looked at with love last week, that when people, maybe even people in the room, but probably not people in the room, um, people use the word church or say the word church, we say it perhaps, uh, if not in a different sense to how the New Testament authors use the word, uh, but certainly missing the scope with which the New Testament authors use this word. So let me pray and we'll get stuck into it. And so, Father God, I want to thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for these words of life. Thank you that you're speaking to us still through these words by your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand today uh, more about what, what is the church, why you've established a church, um, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to be, what it means to belong and be a part of your church. And Father, in every way, help us to bring you glory with our lives. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So this word church, uh, in the New Testament at least, we're looking, you, you may have heard this word, ecclesia, or ecclesia, or ecclesia, or you might think, oh, that sounds like Ecclesiastes. And you're right, it does sound like Ecclesiastes. Now this word <clears throat> made up of the word ek, meaning out of, kaleo, meaning called, or to call. And so when we're talking about the church, at least using the word that the New Testament authors use, the church is, or are, the called out ones. That's what we mean when we say church, ecclesia, the called out ones. In the New Testament, it's usually used simply to mean a gathering or an assembly. It's also used to describe like a public meeting. So if you go to Acts 19, you'll see it used to describe a public meeting, kind of like this, a gathering or an assembly of the called out ones. Uh, in Romans 16, it, it's used to denote a local church, so also like this, like a, a group of people who may not be gathered here today, but the totality of the people that would call, say, City Light their home, that would be a church. <clears throat> uh, in Acts 8, Luke writes to, uh, mentioning the church in a particular region, so you might say the, the church in Adelaide. So you can use the, you know, the word we can use today, like the church in Adelaide or the church in Australia or the church in the West or the church in China, those kinds of things. And then Ephesians 1, uh, the same word used for the church universal. So all of the people who belong to God for all time is also the church. And all of these words, <clears throat> it's the same word, the church, but used in different kinds of ways. And you know how the Bible never uses the word church is to talk about a building? That's almost the sole way that the word church is used today is, oh, I'm going to go to the church, or it's being hosted at the church. Or, and if you go on Google Maps, you'll see, you know, type in churches. Uh, it won't show you churches. 
It'll show you places that churches meet, where churches meet, and it'll call those places churches. And so we have this problem when we almost only use the word church, meaning a building, whereas in Scripture it is almost always talking about an assembly or a group of people, the called out ones. John 17, Jesus prays this high priestly prayer <clears throat> and he asks the Father, he says, I do not ask that you take them, the people of God, his, his fledgling church. He says, don't take them out of the world. I'm asking that you keep them from the evil one. And so Jesus prays for his then disciples, the apostles and all the disciples. He asks the Father, don't take them now. You may wonder, man, why is it that God keeps us around when we come to know him and understand him and know his love and his grace? Why does he just whisk us away? Because sometimes life sucks and it's hard and there's suffering and there's sin. And Jesus says, I, I, don't take him out. He says, they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for the sake I consecrate myself so that, they may sa- so that they may be sanctified in truth. I don't ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. So Jesus prays for his apostles, his disciples, and then he prays for you and for me. And he prays, he asks his father, don't take them out of the world. Although I have called them out of the world, they're no longer of the world. I have also sent them back into the world, just like I was sent into the world. So we're thinking about what is the church or who is the church is a better question. It is those who have been called out of the world and sent into the world, the called out ones. That's the church. Not just those in the first century walking with Jesus, but Jesus prays for everyone who will believe through the centuries, throughout the geography of the earth, because of the word that came from the apostles to the next believers, 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 all the way down to us. That we would know who is the church, the church of those called out of the world and then sent into the world. This is what Jesus prays for. How does he finish his prayer? He says, why? Why have I called them out of the world and sent them back into the world? So that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, perfectly united, to the same degree that God the Son and God the Father are one and perfectly united. Jesus prays that we would be so one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you love me. That's what Jesus prays for us. It's Jesus' prayer for his church. That we would know, we would live as those called out of the world, saved out of our own sin, our own rebellion, saved out of the kingdom of darkness and then in the kingdom of light, sent back into the world as ambassadors for the king of the kingdom, as light carriers, light bringers, so that living, so, so lovingly united, the way Jesus uh, says in John, he says, you know, that the, the love that you have for one another, by your love, all people will know that you belong to me because of your love. He prays we would have that kind of love, that kind of union, that kind of closeness, and that kind of intimacy, so that the world may know that Jesus was sent by the Father and has loved the world even as the Father has loved the Son. So Jesus prays. He sent the apostles, he's sending us, his church. He sent us. He wanted his, wanted his apostles to be unified in their union with Christ on his mission and he wants for our unity as well, the church, and being a people who know who we are in Jesus, unified on our mission. 
That's the church. Or at least that's, that's the foundation of the church. So what does it mean to be called out once? It means we were once traveling this way, in our own, in our own direction, based on our own understanding, even like good understanding, good, like worldly wisdom, doing really well in the world, but by our own devices, leaving as seemed best to us. And then the love of God radically gripped our hearts. The grace of God, who wouldn't let us continue to go our own way, which leads to destruction, but plucks us out of the kingdom of darkness, brings us not just into his kingdom, but into his family, into union with him. We once lived for these things, now we live for the glory of God. It means we once look to the people around us or the culture around us to try to stay in step with the culture to see how, how can we fit in, how can we belong. And being part of God's kingdom means we've been actually taken, uh, whether we are not, we're in the world, but we're no longer of the world. We no longer kind of look around to us and go, what seems best to us based on our own collective understanding? But now we look to God. We see in Jesus absolutely our saviour, but also our Lord and King. And so now our desire is no longer conformity to the world around us. Our desire is to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus in his holiness, in his love, in the way that he related to the Father, in the way that he related to his people, in the way that he related to the world, we're going to be like Jesus. That's what it means. And now <clears throat> we're not ones who are all of a sudden more moral than everybody else, as if we're looking down as a church, like, oh, we've, we've made it. We're awesome. Do you know how good I am? Now I know the truth. Uh, although many Christians are known for that, actually, which sucks. That's not what it means to be the church. It means we are the most aware of our desperate need of a saviour, actually. And then we embody that in our lives together. Most aware of God's love and grace in Jesus. Most aware of God's love for the world. And called to embody the love of God in community and invite others into that community. And so it's a tough ask to say, okay, 30 minutes about the church. Uh, how do we explain everything about the church? So what I want to do is I just want to give a, just a snapshot from one angle about this is what the church could look like according to scripture. So we're not going to go into all of like the, there's a lot, man, we, we could talk about the church a lot, uh, what the church is, the church doing what it is, the church organizing around the doing of what it is. But let's just have a look at <clears throat> one snapshot. Like scripture talks about the church is like a body and we are like one body, Christ the head, and we are all members of one another. And some of, some of us are like a, an elbow, some of us are a knee, some of us are eyes, some of us are fingers, and we need each other. We can't live without each other. And if we try to live without each other, it is living like a dismembered limb or finger, which is gross and leads to death. Uh, scripture talks about the, the church being like a house. So we're all bricks in a house, all being built up in, in love for one another. It talks about us being like a bride, dressed in white, perfect bride for a perfect groom, Jesus. It talks about us being a flock, following the good shepherd, Scripture talks about the church being a royal priesthood and talks about the church being a family. So there's lots of different kind of ways that we could look at what is the church. And each of those different metaphors gives us a different understanding of what the church is. None of them kind of totally, perfectly encapsulates who are we as a church. So let's look at Romans 12. There are a bunch of lists in Romans. We've preached through a couple of them already over the years when looking at what is a church. Here's another snapshot of what it looks like to be the church. This is what Romans 12, Paul writes in Romans 12. It says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Don't be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. 
Bless, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honourable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So how... Paul's giving us a snapshot of what it looks like to live as called out ones who are also sent ones back into the world. He says this, verse 9, have genuine love. We looked at this last week, actually, extensively. What is love? What does it look like? How do we embody it? How do we know it? 3 John, verse 5, in the message, puts it like this. It says, dear friend, when you extend hospitality to Christian brothers and sisters, even when they're strangers, you make the faith, you make the faith visible. So what does it look like to have genuine love? It looks like making the faith, which might seem intangible, actually putting a body to it, making it visible. Like when Jesus says, you know, John 13, 34, 35, and you come, I'm going to give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. So you must love one another, and by this all people will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, there's something tangible about the unity we have displayed in love. From the earliest days of the church, that's one of the things that's written uh, about 200 years AD, uh, talking about the Christians by a non-Christian, says they know one another by secret marks and signs. They love one another almost before they know one another. That's the kind of love that marked the early church. <clears throat> the Greek, Greek writer Lucian uh, earlier said of the church, it's incredible to see the fervour with which the people of that religion help each other in their wants. They spend nothing. The founder has put it into their heads that they are all siblings. Wonderful. This is people who are outside the church looking into the early church. Church father Tertullian said, it's our care for the helpless a practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Look, they say. Look how they love one another. Look how they're prepared to die for one another. We're talking about love being genuine. We're talking about love that is tangible, love that shows. Not performatively. We're not saying, well, okay, so the goal is all people will know that he's disciples if we love one another. Therefore, let's like go out of a way to put a love on display. Uh, we'll do big like you know, love events and that kind of stuff. What he's saying is it's just the regular minutia, the almost boring stuff of life that'll be so, so tinged with love, so founded in love, so rooted in love, that it's undeniable that there is love in that group of people. And it's all the same kind of love that we'd experience elsewhere. It's a different kind of love. Verse 10 says, Love each other like siblings. Have brotherly love among you. Scripture shows us again and again we're family. Church is about a family. Church is about a home. The church is a place of belonging. Again, church is not a building. I love that we don't meet in a like, church building. We mean meeting in a school auditorium. I remember in the early days of when we planted City Light, we met in a, uh, a really sterile, almost hospital-feeling kind of old folks' room. <clears throat> and when we moved into Byron Street in Glenelg, which had previously been a church, I heard someone commenting on the way through the doors, oh, now it feels like we're a real church. And I was like, ugh, I hate that. It's not what the church is. Church is not a building. We meet in buildings and we meet outside buildings and we meet in homes and we meet in cafes and we meet all over the place because we are, we are the church. We are a family. We're a place to belong. Uh, it should feel like coming home. Maybe not at the beginning, but as we grow in love for one another, as we grow in unity with one another, it should feel like home. The church. Being a family means we have a father. First John 3. See what kind of love the father has for us. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. 
We're the same Father. John 1 uh, says, To all who did receive him, this is Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We are the children of God. Ephesians 2, so, when you, so then you're no longer strangers and aliens, not foreigners. Be now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Paul there, like mixing metaphors, but ultimately saying we're family. We're family together. We're in the household of God, not as servants, not as just a military unit, not as workers or serfs, but as daughters and sons. We're family. Some of you may not have had a great kind of family experience kind of in the natural. Um, you know, strained relationship with father or mother or no relationship with father or mother. Siblings. Wider family. Maybe you, you, know, you got along really well with your family and then until the incident, whatever that incident was, uh, for whatever reason, you know, it might be a difficult thing to consider family as being really positive. When we're talking about family from the scriptural perspective, we're talking about the perfect God the Father adopting you and me into his house, into his family as his daughters and his sons. And he loves us with the perfect, perfect love. Well, he doesn't let, he doesn't let us down. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't run away. He's not absent. And not only do we now have a restored relationship with the Father, but he brings us into his family so we can have a relationship with each other as well. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, a place to belong, a place to be known, a place to know others, <clears throat> a place where we don't have to wear that kind of mask that we carry around with everybody else, worrying that, oh my goodness, if they just knew the real me, they would reject me. They, if they knew what I thought, if they knew what I'd done, if they knew who I really was, if I, if I kind of led on to this kind of crazy thing about me, people would reject me. Not so in the church. or It shouldn't be so in the church. Because we're sons and daughters of the Father. We're... We're called into a family where we can be known and where we can truly know. Are we lay down that mask? Where because we are forgiven in Christ, because he already knows everything about us and still loves us, we can be vulnerable with those around us and say, here, let me confess my sin. This is, this is the who of who I am and to be known and loved and accepted because they too have been forgiven. God knows everything about them, all their crazy, all their sin, all their flaws and failures, and yet loves them. And it's true for each one of us. And so we don't look at each other from this haughty, holier-than-thou, up-there kind of position, looking down on everybody else in the struggles. Uh, we, are, we are right down with everybody else, going, yeah, he... Here's how Jesus has wonderfully loved me and saved me in spite of how much I have failed him and maybe failed each other. Family is wonderful in the family of God. It's wonderful. It says, verse 11, serve the Lord enthusiastically with zeal. Be zealous. <clears throat> Remember this is in the context of love. So it's not like just to go like, you know, steamroll over people or mow people down or whatever, or, you know, those kinds of things. But when we serve the Lord, we serve him enthusiastically. So if we're thinking, you know, snapshot of the church, so in the context of the family of God, what does it look like? So it is about making friendships and, and you know, knowing your brothers and sisters and, uh, and growing in the, what you might say, like the, the easier or the good things of that. It is like when we gather, it is about hopefully, you know, ex experiencing the love of God and community. It's about um, like receiving good teaching from Scripture. It is about, you know, hopefully having good music that, you know, we can, we can join with the congregation in, in worshiping God and kind of receive something in that kind of sense. But I hope that 
You understand when it comes to church, all those things are good things. But how scripture paints a picture of church is so much more than that. I want to expand your thinking around what the church can be. And by, by that I really just mean when I kind of help you understand what the scriptures say about what is the church or who are we as a church. So church, the called out ones who gather and are sent back into the world, uh, it is about receiving. But it's not just about receiving religious goods and services. It's also about giving and participating. So church really is about giving and receiving. This is tough because for some of us, we love receiving. <laughs> find it very difficult to give. For others, we love giving. find it very difficult to receive. Being in the family is about giving and receiving. It's both of those things. Sometimes, both at the same time, sometimes, it's most when you're going through you know, difficult times or times of grief, it'd be mostly receiving. But even in the receiving, let me tell you, one of the things the church needs is burdens to be borne. Galatians 6.2, poor us to the church in Galatia says, bear one another's burdens and in so doing, fulfill the law of Christ. Meaning even when you think I'm being a burden, the church needs burdens, actually. You are serving the church by allowing yourself to be served. We need both giving and serving. Giving of your time to greet and welcome people into your life. Giving of your energy to serve others. Not begrudgingly, it says serve the Lord enthusiastically, zealously. So we can approach this, not with, oh my goodness, it's Wednesday night again, DG, let's do it. Or, oh my goodness, it's Sunday morning again, I want set up, I've got to get there at 7.30. Or, oh my goodness, uh, another baby uh, in the church, I've got to make more food. Uh, but rather, oh my goodness, Sunday morning. I'm on setup team. Better get a coffee early. Or, oh my goodness, it's a discipleship group. Or, oh my goodness, my, you know, insert whatever opportunity you have to have someone in your home or in your life. Uh, approach it with zeal. It's about giving your energy to serve others. It's about giving your money to further the kingdom work. And by that, I don't just mean giving to the church. I mean giving to your neighbor in need your brother or your sister who lacks. It's about giving up your life, ultimately. It's about being like Jesus. Giving up your life for the one who gave up his life for you. So the body, the family, we miss out when we don't operate as a family. When we operate as atomistic, like discreetly compartmentalised individual lives, where this is my life and I will... Come, you know, I'll, I'll come to church and then I'm back over here, but never actually embracing the unity of love for whatever reason. And so I'm here and I'll be a neighbor for a bit and now I'm just me again. And then I'll step into my workplace and then I'm just me again or just my family again. Uh, it's, not, it's not what we're called out into, actually. We're called into a family, God's family. Like the, the best kind of family. And when we don't uh, pursue that kind of unity, we miss out, actually. We miss out on your presence. We miss out, miss out on your giftedness. We miss out on your burdens. We miss out on your burden bearing. We miss out on your welcoming. We miss out on your encouragement. We miss out on your admonishment. We miss out on your giving. We miss out on your character. We miss out on your singing. We miss out on your example. We miss out on your joy. When we live as disembodied fingers or eyes that come in and join the body and then go back to their own lives. I'm not saying you don't have a life, you know, apart from the church. I'm saying we're, we're always in the church because the church is not a building where we meet. The church is us who meet in buildings. Now, family, obviously, family can still, can still have a family gathering with not all of the family there, but it's noticeable, oh, my goodness, we miss this person. 
uh, Beck and I recently went to New Zealand to see Beck's family, and there's one cousin who we love. We didn't get to see that one cousin. And we're like, oh, man, we, we, we missed out because that's, that's the nature of family. We missed seeing her. And when we, I'm not saying, you know, well, we've got to be some sort of legalistic, if you're not at church every week and you're not being a real Christian, it's not what I'm saying at all. Um, what I'm saying is, man, we, we are committed to one another. Not just to Sunday, we're committed to one another. So we don't say, or we go to City Light Church. So we don't call these gatherings services. We call them gatherings because it's the gathering of the church. Okay. I love um, uh, one of our former members here who went off to plant North Adelaide, Ruth Jusatis. She used to say, we are a family, so we share the chores. This is how we think about the church. We're not putting on religious goods and services for people to come and receive and consume. We are a family coming together, family gathering every Sunday, family gathering, you know, Monday Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whenever your discipleship group is. When we come to the camp next week, we, this is not the City Light Church, which is some abstract institution putting on an event for us all to come and receive religious goods and services from. It is a family camp that we are all contributing to. So I've been so encouraged. There have been so many people who have either offered to help or when they've been asked, hey, can you look after this? I've said yes, enthusiastically, zealously serving the Lord, or when we've asked, hey, there are individuals or families who can't afford, can people, you know, help meet the gap? People said, yes, enthusiastically, we can, because that's what family does. 13, contribute to the needs of the saints. So we'll always have people in our church community who have a financial need, who have lack or less, for whatever reason, and I hope by God's grace, We'll always have people who have more than they need. And my hope is that we'll be the kind of community where we won't be hoarders, we won't be selfish kinds of people, but we'll be actively looking for the needs in our community. We'll say, oh man, this, this person, this family, this uh, kid, this individual, this whatever, this person needs my help. Now here he's specifically talking about financial needs, but there are many more needs that people have than just finance. It's easy, it's easy and tangible to say, well, you have a this many dollar deficit, I can give you that many dollars and, you know, that's done. It's harder to say, well, you have an emotional need and I'm going to be there for you, I'm going to meet your need. But we need all those kinds of things. Uh, one of the reasons that we don't like, take up a collection here on a Sunday, we, we've never done that, is because when we talk about like giving to further God's kingdom through the work of the church, uh, this is a family gathering. When we invite people to our family gatherings, like if you're having a barbecue, and you invite people to your family gathering barbecue who are outside your church, you don't like to take up a collection and say, oh, can you pay for the sausages, please? <laughs> Neither do we want people who like, give another, in, in, in other means or you know, online or don't have the capacity to give to feel like they're not contributing to the church with their need just because other people can contribute with their excess. And we also want it to be a part of your discipleship, like intentional, strategic giving. So you'd sit down with your family, with your budget, and say, well, how can I intentionally, strategically contribute to the life of the church, uh, you know, organisationally? Or what can I set aside to meet those needs and go actively looking for the needs in my community that I might meet them? We don't want you just to go, okay, well, I've got five bucks today and that's, I feel good about, I've contributed. Verse 13, show hospitality. We talk all the time about being the most welcoming church in Australia. Again, tongue in cheek. But I think that's a good goal, actually. For us to consider welcoming people not just <clears throat> into our moment, so on a Sunday, you know, hello, welcome, uh, but into our lives, into our homes, into our circles of, of friends and intimacy, be welcoming people into our homes. That's how we're going to know people. That's how we're going to have that kind of the unity of love where we can weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice because our life 
is so close and intimate with other people's lives that their rejoicing is our rejoicing. Their weeping is our grief because we're so closely aligned and united in love. We're no longer individually self-seeking, self-making, self-promoting, or self-sustaining. We're now in a family of love. We're called out from that kind of life, not to, not to live like that anymore, and then sent back into the world to show a better way. Verse 17, associate with the lowly. Um, our, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, actually, when we looked at fellowship. Or oh, was it last week, fellowship? Week before was love. Yeah. Looked at this, uh, you know, the church is not a gathering of people who, that are all alike. We don't, we don't all have the same likes. We don't all have the same backgrounds. We don't all have the same bank accounts. We don't all have the same kinds of jobs. We don't have the same kind of understandings. We don't have all the same first languages. Um, We don't all go for the same sporting teams. We don't have the same political affiliations. We are not a people gathered around any of those things. We're gathered around the person and work of Jesus. And so our goal as a church is not to collect a bunch of people who are like us, who we like. The goal of the church is that we would see people who shouldn't in any other arena of life they're not just associating together, but intimately, lives interwoven because of the love they have for Jesus. We don't look down on people. We're not always thinking about relationships through the lens of what can I get out of this? How can they help me? It's incorrect thinking for those who have been saved by grace. Instead, we want, this, we want to show the same kind of love that Jesus has shown for us. He, he didn't have some special need that he had and he looked down from heaven, from his throne and went, oh, I have this great hole in my life. I just need a pet or I need an, another like host of angels or, oh, there's those creation. Maybe they can fill this hole I have in my life. That's not what happened at all. We were his enemies We were against him. We're dead in our sin. And Jesus, because of his love for us, in his love for us, came for us, saved us, loved us. We unlovely ones, he saved. We're his enemies. He counted as friends, as sisters, as brothers. And so how we live as called out ones, we live in the same kind of way. We had to associate with the lowly. Love those who we might consider unlovely because we were the unlovely ones who Jesus has loved. Lastly, verse 18, live peaceably with all. So our goal isn't to antagonize the culture around us, but neither is the church a mirror just reflecting the culture around us. We're called out. And then we're sent back in, not sent back in to just blend back in again, We're not a mirror reflecting culture back to one another. Our goal is to live peaceably. Our goal is not to be most relevant, most up-to-date, most in line with the latest trends. Our goal is not to be a mirror reflecting culture. Our goal is to be a window showing what the world could be like. Not a mirror. We're a window showing the culture, showing our world, what it looks like to be people loved by God, knowing the God of love, living in that love for one another and then inviting the world to come in. Come in. God loves you. This is the kind of church we're called out to become. We're called out to be. People love beyond our wildest dreams, reminding ourselves daily about the love of God, agents of reconciliation between Jesus and those far from him, and living those genuine lives where people can see the gospel of grace at work in our lives in community with one another, just drenched in the love of God. That's the church. 
At least that's one snapshot of the church from one angle. There are many, many other angles. We don't have time for those today. But today we have time for, uh, man, can, could we even just, just that? Can we go for that? Let's be, let's be that. God has already done the work of salvation, of, of the calling out, of the plucking us out of the kingdom, bringing us into his family, into, his, into himself, send us back into the world. Let's not just blend back in. Let's be a community that says, that shows, puts on display, this is the love of God.